Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I see uh, the tennis are surely and fastly they're climbing as they enter the room. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today of the participants and as well soon will you meet the panel members. Um, uh, basically, we're very excited to have you with us and I've seen the registration of we've got people from all over Bahrain from our partner banks from uh, fintechs as well on there. And a lot of the regulators are also watching. So we are hope that we'll get a very great, interesting dis uh, discussion today. Um, I'd just like to introduce myself first. My name is Susie Zira, and I am the head of communications and events for Bahrain Fintech Bay. Uh, a little bit about Bahrain Fintech Bay, in case you don't know about it. I, I know a lot of our members are mainly from Bahrain and around the area, but basically we're a fintech ecosystem builder and we collaborate with various market players, which include government bodies, financial institutions, corporates, investors and innovators, those that believe that technology can bring added value to the financial industry. And our key areas are corporate incubation. We have a co-working space that's located in our capita. We conduct research on fintech trends. Uh, we provide venture acceleration and we create awareness uh, on what's going on in the fintech ecosystem through our events such as these. Um, this, this webinar will be approximately 40 minutes long. If you have any questions, uh, along the way, please feel free to submit them in the Q&A box at the bottom or even in the chat, I'll be looking for them. Um, and if we don't get to your questions, you're more than welcome to email us on the same registration link that you had, which is info at bahrainfintechbay.com. Well, without further ado, I see more members are in. I'd like to introduce our topic today. Uh, today, we're talking about FinCrime compliance for fintechs and digital banking. Fintechs and digital banking have a different financial crime profile to conventional banking. They face unique risks, but have additional tools available to tackle them and can build tailored programs and controls. This webinar will discuss how banks can work within the framework of their existing compliance programs to launch new products and how fintechs can build and develop controls which are tailored to their own risk profile, but are trusted by our partner banks and regulators. And I'm very pleased to have with us all three of our partners in all different fields that would address all of these questions today. I have with me uh, Mazar Jalal, who is the Chief Compliance and Governance at Bahrain Islamic Bank, as you know, at BISB. Uh, Mazar has over 18 years experience in the financial service industry, covering asset management, risk management, corporate governance, and compliance. Welcome, Mazar. Thank you. Thank you, Susie, for having me on this call. Wonderful. Also with me is Maya Brain, who is the Managing Director for the Middle East and Africa at the financial crime consultancy FinTrail. She's led the design and rollout of new compliance programs, scaling and expansion projects, and training courses for a range of traditional banks, for fintechs, for regtechs, and other financial institutions across the region. Hi, Maya, and welcome. I think maybe, oh, maybe you're, yeah, I am, you're, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Hi, thanks, it's great to, great to be here. Great, great. And last, but certainly not least, we have Mohammed al Najib, who's head compliance examination banks at the Central Bank of Bahrain. With over nine years of experience working with the Bahraini regulator, uh, Mohammed is responsible for overseeing the assessment of AML CFT frameworks of the banking sector in the Kingdom of Bahrain. And I'm very excited to have you here, Mohammed, as well. I think we have wonderful perspective from every side of this, this discussion. Thank you very much. I think it's my pleasure to be here. That's my first FinTech event uh, with FinTech Bahrain. So uh, let's hope that this is going to be a great session. Wonderful. And so great. Well, I'm just going to throw it out there. You, we talk about digital transformation changing the compliance department. Mazar, I guess it's initial to you, and I'll, I'm sure that Maya and, and Mohammed would love to come in. How do you see bank compliance and AML functions catching up with the changes in operating models today? Well, I think um, this is a very interesting topic and, and uh, topic and probably the topic of uh, I, would, I wouldn't call it the topic of the day, but topic of 2021 and, and probably slightly earlier because of the COVID. Now, uh, we at BRSB, when we started talking about, you know, uh, 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 digital banking and, and fintech and, and, and so forth, uh, the first thing we did is we said, guys, what's the strategy of the bank and how do we align ourselves with that strategy? So if a board has a strategy to go south and we are going north, then obviously it's not going to work out. So we had the board strategy, obviously, you know, uh, uh, presented to us. And, and then we said, okay, fine. Let's now do a high level mapping. And this is a very interesting word that I always use and people probably, uh, you know, hate me for this. So there's always a mapping exercise that needs to be carried out between this strategy and how it fits in your compliance model. Now we did that. And after that, there's something very important that we need to do is the risk uh, assessment and, and, and the risk appetite. So uh, based on the strategy provided and after doing the mapping with the relevant rules, we said, guys, these are the do's you can do. Uh, these are the things you can do. And these are the things you cannot do. The rule books are very clear. Uh, 
and 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 the regulator at Bahrain is probably a phone call away. So if there is an interpretation issue, you can always call them, and and you'll get your do's and don'ts uh, clarified right away. So that was the second pillar, I would say. The third pillar, which is very important in the world of fintech, is to have the right technology partner. There are a lot of uh, you know uh, providers available. So we chose, um, uh, 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 honestly speaking, the best of best, and 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 we partnered with them and. Uh, and you guys can see the results now. The fourth pillar, which is very important, and probably in the world of risk and compliance, people uh, uh, try to ignore it, is the simplification and how to be customer centric. You can have the best compliance model on earth. You can have the most sophisticated email system. But if it's so difficult that your customer, they don't want to bank with you, then what's the point of having this uh, system? For we made sure that all the way starting from the strategy to risk capital to the technology partnership selection, we made sure that the process uh, uh, to the extent allowed by the regulator will be very simple and straightforward and, and customer uh, centric. Uh, post that any provider that we uh, onboarded, any solution provider, obviously this is now history, but back then uh, we made sure that they have the API capabilities available because today you talk to different systems using API. We would love to have uh, you know, more of RPA providers joining us. Uh, there's someone on the call here. I think they, they, they recently registered with FinHub973. Uh, uh, They're trying to help the industry with uh, the Ministry of Justice blocking and unblocking by way of doing an RPA. We are very excited uh, uh, to work with them and uh, uh, we'll take it from there, inshallah. But this is the high level of what we, we did as a matter of strategy. As a result of which today we have our retail onboarding platform uh, through, a mobile, uh, uh, through a mobile app. Less than three minutes, you can have your account open. Then you have access to your e-banking. You can do transactions, Fauri, Fauri Plus. Uh, you have now the corporate onboarding live at BISB, uh, which is one of its type uh, in the MENA region. We are the first one. Again, a big thanks goes to the regulator here and the Ministry of Industry and Commerce. Uh, had, the, had they not had a faith in us, probably this would have not been possible. So today, uh, I can tell you the onboarding of uh, sigilis and individual establishments in Bahrain is at least five-fold higher than what it used to be in a traditional uh, uh, bank. So that's all because of, of the, uh, you know, the blockchain that we have created with the ministry. And uh, it's, it's, uh, it's ongoing, guys. Uh, we have Amazaya, uh, they are coming up with their APIs. We have now IGA, they have released the, uh, the APIs through uh, benefit to banks to do the KYC update. Uh, we have already integrated with them through API. So it's coming, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's on its way. Uh, you cannot stop it, but that's uh, from my side to start with. Absolutely. I don't, know. I don't know if Mohammed, you have anything, I guess there's a lot of support from the, the central bank as well in terms of supporting all of these, you know, uh, changes so far. I don't know if you have any comments to make about that before I move on to the next question. Um, I think what Mazar was touching upon is, is extremely important. Uh, number one reason, so I can give you a holistic perspective. Uh, Mazar has given you a specific firm ex uh, example. When it comes to changing and expecting the, the private sector or the bank specifically and the financial uh, institutions to change, we're asking a lot from them. Banks have been used to the traditional frameworks of AML CFT compliance. Now we're introducing technology. And um, many of the issues that we face um, from day to day when it comes to applications of digital onboarding, uh, companies trying to graduate from the regulatory sandbox, it's the number one issue that we face is AML CFT. And what, what, is, what the market is trying to tell us is that change your regulations and then we can be able uh, to comply. But that's not what we're trying. I mean, we're an agile regulator. We try to be an enabler here. We don't want to. We don't want regulations to stop any kind of uh, financial innovation, financial inclusion, and all of the other objectives that the CV is very clear on. But at the same time, uh, there is a duty on the same financial institutions and banks to clean up their house. This is the first step that needs to be done, and then all the technological advancements can can go there. This is a fundamental aspect that cannot be underestimated. So we see a lot of requests. Sometimes they're rejected, sometimes they're um, accepted. But just to give you a general feeling, a general theme of where the market is going, I think there is a varying level of compliance. Um, some banks have a strategy in mind. Their strategic objective is to be one of the largest institutions in Bahrain. Uh, but at the same time, they're not working to have a compliance framework that works with them. 
others, they might not have as big of an initiative or an objective, but they're trying to comply as much as possible. So again, you need to align both of them. And um, from my experience, I still, and this is something that makes me a bit sad when I say it, I still haven't seen a financial institution in Bahrain that have alleviated its compliance level to, to, to an extent where we can use it as a prototype. There is a lot of progress. There's a lot of work that's being done, but at this point in time, it's very hard to do so. So we're working hand in hand. The same thing applies to the regulator. So yeah. we're asking the sector to do, to have all of these technological advancements. The same, the same thing applies to our, uh, our in-house uh, development. We're trying also to alleviate our, our way uh, of supervising institutions, including introducing technological advancements like subtech. We will, we will talk about this more uh, in the next questions, definitely. That's fa very fast. That's fascinating stuff. Well, Maya, let's go to you as, as a as a fintech. What 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 is different about financial crime compliance for independent fintechs? Yeah, I think this is really interesting. Sitting alongside what Mazar was saying about how the banks are approaching um, digital operations, how they are different again for fintech firms which don't have that legacy of doing things the conventional way and are starting from scratch. Um, so there are advantages to that, obviously, in that they're designing digital solutions and agile, customer centric controls from scratch and they can design them to fit that business model they're not dealing with legacy systems and you know incomplete and messy data that's siloed in different places which is a problem for some of the the larger conventional banks um, but obviously they have less e expertise to draw on less data as well and less um, information and insight on their customers um, they're generally smaller firms they're generally being used as a secondary financial um, product so they don't have you know they're not the customer's main bank account so they've got much much less data to work with to assess risks look for unusual transactions understand who the customer is and how they should be transacting um, and yeah as I said sort of they're, they're smaller and they don't have that inbuilt expertise quite often um, one of the initial founders will start off double hatting and covering compliance as well um, and we've seen we've worked with firms that um, you know, at both ends of the spectrum, some who don't have dedicated compliance people for quite some time and want to build out their product and design the offering first and then bring in compliance later on, which leads to all sorts of problems. The more successful ones are obviously aware that they should bring in compliance right from the beginning, even when they're not sure exactly how the product's going to work and what it's going to look like. They have someone with that compliance expertise to help them build it so that they know it's going to be compliant, they understand the regulatory expectations uh, and can make sure that they're meeting them from day one so they don't have to go back and change things. Um, but one of the other key considerations for independent fintechs is that they can't operate by themselves. And so they need to make sure that their program not only addresses their own business model and their own risks, but that it's gonna work when they partner with a conventional bank, for instance, or other third parties, if they're using a banking as a service provider, for instance. Um, the most fintechs will be operating under a bank's or a, a BAS provider's license. Um, and so they need to make sure that as soon as possible, once they know who they're going to have that relationship with, they're talking to them not only about the business model, but about compliance and they're understanding what their banking partner requires from them. So there's a clear split of roles and responsibilities. They can explain any tech tools that they're using to the bank, make sure that they're comfortable with them um, and that that you know that they are also comfortable with the the fin crime program, uh, and the same with any third parties as well that they're using to outsource transaction monitoring reviews, for instance, or KYC. That they understand exactly how that third party operates, and that they're really comfortable with the details of how that works. Um, so because they have this greater reliance on outside parties, they can't just look at it you know through their own lens. They need to make sure these other parties they understand how they work, and that everyone is comfortable with. Um, the the controls that they're proposing. Yeah, I mean, I mean, basically, when we go back to again, I go I guess this is a question as well for for Mohammed and and, and also for, uh, for for Mazar. You know, how's the regulator helping? I think Mohammed hits you first as well. How's the regulator helping banks to cope with market expectations versus the actual needs of what's going on? So, um, in a traditional context, I think there's a lot of banks that are working very well. But when it comes to future expectations and the introduction of technological advancements and compliance, I think this is a work in progress. This is something where the regulator has a job of trying to educate the market. But at the same time, uh, we cannot take the role of the actual financial institution. So we can issue guidance 
uh, we can have the open talks uh, forums. Uh, we do a lot of uh, open discussions. I think Mazar is well aware and other people, um, I think part of the participants, we have a lot of calls with, uh, with this sector. And uh, this is part of either the digital onboarding initiatives or any other initiatives related to FinTechs. So um, all the regulator can do is to put the necessary guidelines uh, to give certain level of guidance on how to do or, or what is the regulator is expecting. At the end of the day, the regulator has a mandate of financial stability, ensuring transparency and a level playing field. We, don't, we do not want any, uh, any financial institution to have a competitive, unfair competitive advantage over the other. So we try to, to ensure that the regulations are sound enough to cover everything. Again, uh, from what I've been experiencing in the market, I think there are um, certain groundwork, groundwork that needs to be done first. And uh, these issues will definitely, once they're fixed, will definitely help uh, financial institutions to go to the next level of, of uh, introducing fintech solutions uh, to, to financial crime specifically. And in and, and that context, I'm just talking about traditional financial institutions. Fintechs, on the other hand, they have, um, it's, it's all a new subject. Even for us as regulators, we're we do not still understand every single aspect of it. So it's a learning exercise for it. So when we're looking at things at the proof of concept, uh, proof of concept stage, uh, it's very hard for us to comprehend. So we, we look for, we ask for subject matter experts. We try to educate ourselves. We as a regulator need to have the technical know-how. So um, it's both a learning experience for us and the market, definitely. Thank you, thank you, Mohammed. Mazar, I don't know if you wanted to add to that as well from a banking perspective. I'm sure you, you have some comments as well you'd like to make. Sure, sure. I, I think one point that Mohammed made is worth um, uh, you know, re-emphasis here. The role of the regulator globally, not, not only in Bahrain, is to make sure market stability, i.e. you open these accounts using any form, conventional form, digital form, mobile app, and all that stuff. The ultimate objective is that you're getting money from the right source. Uh, for the customer's own protection, the money is uh, uh, parked in an account which is totally secured. Uh, the transactions are totally secured. But these things need to be, uh, uh, you know, uh, properly channeled. Uh, again, I'll go back to my initial comment where I said uh, there needs to be a proper mapping exercise before we do anything else. So when you do uh, your mapping, you need to make sure that you not only comply with the CVB regulation because those are the basic guidelines, as Hamad was clarifying. You need to have your internal control environment airtight because you're talking about someone else's money, guys. You can't, you know, uh, uh, you know, just, just to say that, you know, I'm partnering with the FinTech and I want to be the first one to come out in the market and, and, and be a market leader. You can't just compromise on basic controls. You can't just compromise on someone uh, else's money. For, for, for that, uh, yeah, you know, my comment on, on the regulation. Uh, when, when you say how prepared the, uh, the local uh, regulator is when it comes to FinTech, I think this is a life example. Uh, we are all sitting here, the regulator is here. They're being very transparent as to what is available and what's not available. And, and, and you know, how we can jointly work together and, and, and take it to the next step. Uh, uh, you have the FinHub uh, 973 launched in Bahrain. I know a couple of uh, uh, partners that they are talking to uh, uh, based out in, in UAE for a huge credit engine model, which will help us build the ECL models and all that stuff. So yeah, there's a great, great progress. Having said that, I think what we have achieved jointly as an industry is probably 25, 30% of what the FinTech is all about. Uh, I think over the course of next two to three years, we will see a lot of development. Uh, I, I wish we had benefit with us uh, because they are a very important partner in this discussion. Uh, if you look at their strategy roadmap, again, uh, I'm amazed because you know they've been, they've been very transparent over the last strategy uh, committee meeting that I attended. They are talking about you know taking this to the next step where we would be able to issue you know proper consumer financing, microfinancing or, or, or otherwise through a mobile app. For, it's on its way. You can't stop it. Uh, you know benefit is again regulated by CBB we as financial institution. We are regulated. So yeah, there's a lot of synergy. There's a lot of calibration between the partners, and uh, I think sky's the limit. Honestly speaking. That's exciting news. Maya, just going back to you, how can digital tools help in, ter in terms of on, in, this, in the subject matter exactly? Um, I mean, there's obviously lots of different stages of yeah. financial crime um, programs yeah. where they can be used. Um, so for digital onboarding, that's the, probably the most common one that people are all aware of. Um, also for you know, screening as part of that. Um, and also on the 
during the course of the relationship as well for enhanced transaction monitoring, uh, identifying suspicious activity, um, potentially the movement of illicit funds. Um, and that can be a simple alert system or it can be more complicated um, AI sort of iterative learning programs, um, which can to some extent to some extent replace what a human analyst would previously have done or at least supplement it. So you're still going to need a balance between the tech tools and, and human intervention. Um, and the same thing with onboarding, you'll always have cases where the systems um, need, you know, you need someone to actually look at it and to understand the, the output. So if the tool says that this is a, a pep hit or a um, there's a hit with adverse media against this person, you often need a person to look at it. So digital tools are not going to completely replace um, the human intervention in the process, but they can they can definitely help. Um, they're obviously going to make a real difference in terms of um, improving the process, making it more automatic and quicker. Digital onboarding is obviously much more uh, streamlined and quick for customers than doing it manually with um, you know, either going into a bank or showing physical documents to, uh, to the bank. Um, but they can also help make better use of existing data, for instance. So as well as the traditional data points like your name, address, passport number, et cetera, um, there's additional information that you can gather to show how your customer interacts with your service. So you can look at their geolocation, for instance, on their device. So if they've told you that they live in Bahrain and they have an address in Bahrain, but you see that they're always logging in from somewhere else, a high risk jurisdiction, you understand that bit more about them, that they are not necessarily resident where you thought they were. Um, and you can also look for links between your customers and known fraudsters or criminals or patterns which indicate that this may be a network of people rather than one customer. So a large number of people using a shared device, for instance, that would be quite unusual normally. Um, people tend to have their own phones. So that could be an indication of an organized crime gang or human trafficking or something where people are being made to open an account by the gang master um, using shared devices. So you can use tech tools to pick up on suspicious patterns and things like that that help tell you more about the customer. Uh, and that can then feed into your customer risk rating, so how you work out which of your customers are higher risk, uh, your transaction monitoring program, so the thresholds that you set and how closely you analyze the transaction behavior for higher risk versus lower risk clients, uh, and also how you conduct investigations where you have identified a concern, you can draw from all these different data points. Um, and again, um, banks or independent fintechs which use tech tools are likely to have better access to all of the customer's data and transaction data, KYC, um, easily accessible in one place, um, links to previous investigations, um, interactions with other customers, et cetera, and be able to use tools to analyze that more quickly so that analysts can, you know, you're not relying on a human analyst pulling lots of different bits of information from different places. You can conduct more comprehensive and thorough investigations, making the best possible use of the data. Um, there's also a couple, I just touched on a couple of other really, in, you know, there's some interesting solutions that we've seen, uh, reg tech tools, which are proposing alternatives to traditional KYC onboarding points. So, you know, a, a common, you know, how do you want, the point of KYC is understanding who your customer is, right? And so the traditional way of doing that is with documents. So you have a passport, you have a utility bill or something proving address. Um, but I mean, particularly proof of address can be quite easily forged and doesn't necessarily tell you that much about a person. Um, so we've seen some really innovative and interesting solutions in this space, which either look at customers' behavior on that device um, across other services, so not just your service, your, your bank. Um, there's one which I could, you know, to give a concrete example, um, one which introduces the idea that a new customer for you as a bank is not a new person. They will be an existing customer for other companies out there. And so their identity has been verified and is established with other people. Uh, and so what this service is, it's like a peer-to-peer -peer network for validating new users. So you share the details which you have been given for this new user with the network and other companies in the network report back and say, yes, we have seen that person. They appear to be a real person. Um, it's interesting because it's not just banks. So it's companies like, um, so online retailers or taxi firms. So again, if you get a report back from them, which says, yes, we have this person, this date of address, this phone number, and this address, and this is where they get their shopping delivered. This is where they get picked up from with taxis. That's much more meaningful proof of address than a utility bill. Um, so other ways of, of using data and other uh, information from other companies to validate people's identity in a way that goes way beyond just looking at documents. Oh, that, that's fascinating. I mean, Rizal, we were talking about, you know, talking about AI and FinTech, do you, do you think it's a game changer or do you think it's another bubble? Well, uh, uh, I'll have a small... Yeah, go ahead. 
I'll, I'll have a small comment on, on what Maya said, and, and I'll try and, uh, you know, sort of relate it with the, uh, what I meant earlier by uh, the risk appetite and, and how we do uh, our risk assessment. So so what Maya said is is, is obviously fantastic, and, and this is the way forward. And this makes a lot of sense for, you know, uh, jurisdictions which are huge. When, it, when you talk about Bahrain, for example, uh, instead of, you know, getting into AI and, and trying to fetch the customer data from different sources, what the regulator has done is they have a requested benefit to come up with, uh, again, this is to comply with the, the, the personal data protection law. Uh, 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 so basically, if a customer gives you the consent, which is called WAFIC uh, in, in benefits world, you will be able to get the data on your customer from a very authentic source that is IGA uh, in, I would say, milliseconds. So, uh, you know, this A brings your risk profile, uh, uh, you know, almost down to zero because you're getting the information from the source itself. So imagine if this customer comes to the bank and he brings his ID, smart card and passport, the information uh, available on those ID card is basically coming from IG. So instead of you carrying those physical document, you will get the information directly from IG. This will bring your risk uh, 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 appetite to a level which is super acceptable by, by any regulator, by any board, by any compliance officer, A, B. Uh, to onboard a customer, if you use, again, alternative means such as, you know, pulling his data, let's say from, I don't know, a shop in city center there, which he regularly, regularly visits and all that, probably the cost of getting the information from that source is, is double than getting it from IGA. So A, it's very expensive, B, unauthentic uh, source, and hence, you know, I, I would say B as a compliance officer and probably the regulators, uh, you know, uh, 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 discomfort, if I may say, to get this information from a party which cannot be authenticated. But, uh, uh, you know, uh, for countries like Saudi Arabia or, or bigger jurisdictions, this makes a lot of sense. And, 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 and I'm sure this is the way forward. So that was just my comment on, on Maya's, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, comment on, on uh, onboarding. Uh, when we talk about the AIs, um, is it a game changer or not? It's definitely a game changer, but again, within the acceptable risk appetite, now, when you talk about deploying AI in uh, closing false AML alerts, which is the problem for most of the banks in Bahrain, I think we are a bit far away from reality. A, we don't have the historic data in a manner that a machine can analyze it and provide a decision B. At least I have not come across any provider so far, be it a FinTech or otherwise, that has given me a proper AI solution. In most of the cases, what they do is they, they build the logic and they come and tell you, well, this is the logic and this is how it's going to work. So, you know, your own IT team can build that logic. AI can definitely work very well when it comes to credit decisions. I, you know, there's a regulation which says you cannot give more than 50% of, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the gross income uh, to an individual. The AI will do the job and, and it will give you the decision. But when it comes to very subjective issues and especially things which are like uh, 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 close to our heart uh, to ensure that we comply with IMF regulation, we comply with FATF, we comply with MENA FATF. I think taking a risk and, and relying on IA at this point in time is going to be, uh, it's not going to be easy. And, and, and at least I as a compliance officer wouldn't recommend it. Uh, but uh, as I said, other uh, propositions when it comes to credit, issuing a credit card, because you have already done the authentication, so you are good. You know the money is not going to uh, someone who we should not go to. Their AI is definitely a big, big game changer. And uh, probably in a year or so, you will see uh, AI talking a lot. Now, there's always a fear uh, between, uh, you know, the bankers that, you know, if you deploy RPA, you deploy AI, then what will happen to the human being? You know, you're replacing them, they'll be jobless. I think this perception needs to be changed. If you look at most of our fresh graduates, they're not interested in sitting back, uh, you know, behind a PC and inputting name and CPR number and all this stuff. They are very creative, by the way, more creative than probably I am. But they want, uh, you know, to, to work uh, with uh, people who are innovative. They are innovative, so they will come up with new ideas. Uh, and hence, all this stuff should be treated, uh, i.e. the back office stuff should be treated as legacy. Uh, allow the AI or the RPA to deal with it. Uh, at BISB, I can give an example. We did all this automation, but we did not let any of our resource go. The profile has changed. So instead of the guy, you know, doing this job every day and getting bored, we changed his role from inputter to a quality assurance. So the machine is doing the job. 
He used to think they're doing a quality assurance much easier, much controlled, much cleaner than what it used to be. And guess what? The data quality that you're getting today is at least 110 times better than what it used to be. So yeah, AI is definitely a game changer, but with the right time. Hey, Mohammed, I'd love to hear your comments on some of the things that Maya, <laughs> Maya and Mazar said. I think a lot has been said. Maya did an excellent coverage on the building blocks of, uh, of uh, digitalization and um, AML CFD compliance in specific. But I think um, just to focus on, um, on AI without talking about the root cause of other issues is I will go back to the same, uh, the same idea. I will, not, uh, I, I, I will not stop there because the thing is we're, we're talking about AI and all the financial uh, innovations when it comes to um, complying with AML CFD. But AI is all about data. If you have data integrity issues, if the data is not established well enough with historical uh, timeframes that are appropriate to understand the AML CFT components, then the introduction of AI is just a fancy term. We don't want that. We want actual change. We want an automation of the process. And we want at the end of the day to protect the financial integrity of the markets. For us to do so, we need to go back, look at our data integrity, make sure that banks are doing their part. Um, I think one of the, um, although I'm one of the supporters of AI, but I think it's an overused term nowadays without people understanding its consequences. So one of the things that uh, I've seen realistically, not just in Bahrain, but internationally from our uh, experiences is that um, the, the models that are employed in AI, and specifically when we talk about machine learning, which is a component of AI, uh, can lead to data bias and data overfitting. So the data can give you a certain relationship a causation that does not exist in the first place. Now, the calibration of this model, what comes into it and how this model needs to be fixed is something that is uh, entirely up to the sector. We can put the safeguards as a regulator, we can put the necessary guidelines. But again, we need people that, are, uh, that have the technical know-how at the actual licenses or uh, FIs and, and, uh, and other banks. And at the same time, it requires a level of um, um, complexity. It just comes with it. So you need to be completely dynamic, up to date, and there's a complete follow up. And it also involves other risk management systems, governance, and uh, specifically uh, issues related to um, the effect or the final output of all of this. I think AI can be a solution in one way, and actually in many ways, but I've seen a valid example, and this has also been implemented internationally, where um, the, the, the idea of, um, text mining has been used to identify poor data. So text mining and, uh, and other, uh, other parts of machine learning, I'm not a subject matter expert, but this is what I've seen uh, specifically, uh, they would go back and identify relationships or business relationships that do not have the necessary data to calculate the final residual risk related to the customer. So it has been able to do gap analysis uh, and then correct it accordingly. So instead of spending unnecessary time and employing a lot of resources on false positives that we've, that we've been saying, AI can be a solution in order to address legacy problems. Uh, but the legacy problems, again, need to be fixed for all the innovations to take place. Uh, if you allow me one more point, I think Yasmin, um, yes. hi Yasmin, thank you very yes, much for joining. She, 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 she's putting forward a very interesting I'm question. I'm just about to yes. ask you the question as well. Just exactly. I'm thinking, she's putting but, me on the spot, but I will, I will still address it. <laughs> yeah. So maybe, so, I, so, maybe I'll just read the question because I don't think that the viewers have seen it. So tech challenge is moving faster than regulations. What is the regulator in Bahrain doing to make sure that regulations are revised to keep up with the changing nature of financial service, which is moving towards digitalization? So that, that's a great, great question. I think she's putting you on the spot. Excellent. I, I actually like it. And I will, I will address some of the regulations that we've introduced. So when it comes to financial crime, we introduced an entire module just focusing on virtual assets and cryptocurrencies. Uh, we focused on the nitty gritty details of how to do the verification mechanism, customer due diligence, how to do the risk rating, what are the automated transaction monitoring systems that are expected and the screening measures, all of which are the traditional components of of any, of any financial institution that is operating in Bahrain. But we're bringing it to the field of FinTech. And we're trying as much as possible to uh, educate the market. So as part of our education uh, project, we've issued guidance papers. Uh, we've also um, issued something that spins off from another guidance paper issued by the compliance director that spins off uh, from the FATF's paper on virtual currencies. So all of that has been trying to educate the market and to provide the necessary guidance. Again, the, 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 uh, the 
the responsibility is focused on is, is primarily focused on the market themselves. They need to be educated and we need to oversee the process. As a, as a regulator, we try to be an enabler. We will not allow any regulations to stop any kind of financial innovation. But again, we need to revisit our own mandate and we need to ensure that financial stability is at the forefront of the agenda. Thanks, Mohammed. You have one more question that was in, in the chat. It was an action question. It's from Balu Rath Muthri. I hope I said your name right. He said he's excited to know about the positive developments. You've already gone through some of those. And uh, the could he, thought, he basically wants some light into the, the financial crime module rules and guidance. Could you throw some light on the roadmap for 2021 in this area? So we have many plans uh, and the, 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 the new developments, which are still not out there and it's still under study by the CBB, is to introduce a digital onboarding section as part of the financial crime model. This will ensure that everyone is well aware of the rules and regulations and that there is a level playing field for everyone to operate within. It also helps us when we do our own site examination uh, in order to have a very clear guidelines that we follow. So hopefully this will help the market understand what the requirements and whenever there is a visit from the central bank, whether it's an on-site examination or an off-site supervisory exercise, everyone is on the same page and they will be assessed according to very clear regulations. Thanks, thank you, Mohammed. Um, Mazar, I guess or, as well, my, there's an, uh, an audience member called Amir Hanif. He's asking, are banks working with their financial partners to understand the tools the FinTechs are developing and sharing with the regulator on, on how these tools help mitigate uh, a, a financial crime risk. He's asking how's the relationship been, I guess, between, I guess the question both for Maya and Mazar on how, you know, how have they been working with the par partners to understand the, the tools that even Maya has been saying. I think you can answer that for um, Amir, um, either one Mazar or Maya or both. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'll take a lead there, uh, but, but just to um, uh, answer, or just to comment on the previous question, how the regulations are catching up uh, with the developments in the industry. I, I think most of the time when I get this question, I reverse engineer it. My question always to the audience is that guys, what is it that you need in the regulations to bring uh, your new uh, product into life? Uh, it was, I think last week when someone approached me and, and, and we were discussing, you know, a product and they were saying, oh, the regulations are not available and, and, and so on and so forth. And, and when we started unwinding the structure, it turned out that the guy would like to launch something called crowdfunding. And guess what? The regulations were released to uh, Mohammed back in 2018, if I'm not mistaken. So, so, so the regulations are available. It's just someone needs to go and, and, and probably I would say Google it and say, okay, fine. How do I fit this regulation in my model? But I, I would, you know, bluntly ask this question to the audience here that guys, please tell me a product that, uh, you know, you, you would like to launch. And, and there's a regulation telling you not to do it. So, so, so that's probably, uh, I don't know, shall I call it an open challenge to the audience here, but anyway. I'll, uh, <laughs> Go ahead and type uh, it in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I think I think the question that was raised earlier that how the fintech and banks are working together to uh, 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 or, or what's the current you know synergies between the fintech and the banking industry? Uh, I think again as as a startup we have just started the the fin hub uh, uh, and uh, 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 you know uh, there are fintech companies they're coming they're presenting they're telling us oh, how they can help us. So uh, it's a journey and and I would say this is the this is the beginning, uh, but. Uh, because of the speed of fintech, I don't think it's going to take us five years to, you know, say that, oh, we have a 80% correlation between the fintechs and, and the banking industry. Probably two years down the line, you will hear, you know, something totally different than what we are talking about. So uh, that's that's my view on, on, on this energy. So probably Maya can help us a bit more. Yeah, um, I think so. Just one other thing I'll add to the point about the, the regulations and the regulators' involvement, because so I think Mohammed's probably too modest to, to say this outright. Um, but Bahrain, in particular, is in a really good position uh, in terms of the regulatory environment, and it's much better than most other markets in the region and more broadly as well, um, with specific regulations on things like, as you mentioned, um, Mazar crowdsourcing crypto, open banking, robo-advisory, all of these um, which the regulators have issued in the last few years um, and which don't exist in, in other markets in the region. So there are specific regulations covering these areas of innovation, um, whereas in other markets, these are either gray areas and it is very unclear for firms what they can and cannot do, 
or they can't get licensed for those products because the, the regulators are not open to those ideas. So I think, yeah, the, the regulator in Bahrain is, as, as you have been saying, it is true, it is very agile and open to, um, to the market and to listening to what market participants need and how the market is developing. And it is trying to, to address that. And obviously it's an ongoing process. And um, as you say, Mohammed, it's a question of the regulator learning about all these innovations as well. It's, um, it's new concepts for everybody. Um, but I do think Bahrain is in a very good position. Um, and in terms of the fintechs and banks working together, I think I've seen this very hugely across the region. Um, and there are some banks who will partner with fintechs, but under quite strict conditions where they basically lay out the compliance program, which the fintechs have to meet and the fintechs adopt the controls the banks have imposed. Um, or the banks will conduct, for example, like the transaction monitoring and investigations of suspicious activity in house, um, which works if you have that clear breakdown in roles and responsibilities and both sides know what they're responsible for. Um, but it does hinder the ability of fintechs to to be innovative or come up with controls which are better suited to their product and accordingly to the risks that they face because they are different. And so if you try and impose the controls which work for a bank, they're not specifically designed to meet the risks posed by the fintech. So, you know, it could be, there could definitely be improved and there could be a better model. Um, and I think it's going to be interesting to see in the region. Um, I know in in one GCC market, there is there a bank or two who want to be seen as sort of the go-to bank for fintech partnerships. And it will be interesting in the next couple of years to see which banks actually genuinely emerge playing that role. Uh, and I think the ones that will, will work out a framework for how they partner with fintechs and what their partnership onboarding process is. So the information they need from the fintechs about their product and customers and their risk base um, and the risk assessment they conduct on their fintech partners, and then a process for how they define the governance framework and the fin crime controls. Um, and the it's a question of doing it at volume, I guess, is that if they're partnering with a number of fintechs, it will be worth designing a program like that and really thinking about the best way to make the most of the fintechs understanding of their risks and their responses to how they think they should deal with it. Um, but I think at the moment that's still quite quite nascent and quite early days and is something that will probably be developed in the next yeah, few years maybe. Thanks, thanks, Maya. Thanks everyone for your input. I think this is very key just to need to wrap to wrap up like that. There's lots, there's lots of questions coming in. But just as looking to the future, I mean, because everyone's asking, I see all the questions, they they pretty much have different uh, points, but many of them asking, what's the future going to be like? Like, will you have a job in five years as, as a traditional compliance officer? Or what what can they see um, that's going to happen and, and how and, and there's I see some of you are typing, uh, the panelists are typing personally to them, but how do we see the future in terms of of traditional compliance and moving away. You've mentioned some very key points, but uh, Mazar, maybe I'll ask you to take this one to start off with, and then Mohammed, maybe you can come in afterwards and, and Maya, just for the wrap up last question. If we didn't get to any of your questions today, please feel free to write us. Um, this is recorded as well. You can watch it on YouTube afterwards. And if there are any questions, you've got the e email address, the same one that you registered with, please feel free to reach out to us. Go, go ahead, uh, Mazar, please tell us sure. about the future. Well, uh, uh, let me t let me speak about myself. I mean, uh, you have seen BISB uh, and this uh, digital world uh, progressing really fast. Uh, digital onboarding, corporate onboarding, you know, top of financing and all that stuff. And obviously, there's a big role played by uh, the you know the 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 AML team here uh, at BISB, and obviously the compliance and governance team, risk management is uh, you know on top of all the SOPs and 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 the control uh, requirements. I can tell you safely, but uh, if I continue with the same pace probably out of, I will be out of a job after three years. So I need to really, you know, uh, uh, work harder to keep up with the uh, with the changes in the market, with what the FinTech has to offer, with the way the banks will definitely change to, uh, you know, a digital uh, uh, operating model. Uh, I guess they don't have an option because some of the competitors uh, in the market, they have adopted a very, I would say, uh, effective uh, uh, operating model, which brings their cost uh, uh, ratio substantially lower than the industry average. So if we don't act fast and we don't act in the right direction, which is nothing but FinTech and digital banking, then definitely I need to find myself something else. Wow. And Mohammed, how do you feel about that? He's happy. <laughs> Not happy at all. I would love to see you, Mazar. I don't want you to leave. That's, that's something I need to say heart to heart. But another thing that I think it's one of the common themes that I find when I go to any on-site examination is that 
compliance people will always say that management would uh, criticize them for having very high costs. They're not a business unit. They, they're a cost center and they tend to be costly. With passage of time, it's even becoming, um, uh, it's becoming very detrimental to the financial health of, of an institution itself. So the question is, uh, will banks do anything to decrease this cost? Definitely. So with automation, with the new innovations in the market, the, the need for human intervention will decrease significantly. It will not be eliminated. Any operating model will have human intervention uh, to it. But to what extent? I think that's very hard to predict. Um, this applies to us as regulators, as on-site examiners. I don't think we will be doing traditional on-site examination by going and visiting institutions. Maybe instead of having five or six individuals, will be two individuals with a machine. We never know what's going to happen in five years. So this, and I hope I stay in my job at the time, or I will go to the private sector. I don't know. It depends. So, but as far as uh, as we're concerned, I think this is one of the things that we need to address. People are afraid. So uh, let's give them hope that their involvement will be there. Thank you. And um, yours, you're Maya. You take it away. I think I was just going to add on to that. I think the idea that. You know, as I think we've all been saying, compliance officers are not going to be replaced by technology or AI or any of these tools. And um, you will always need people and technology, but it's going to move people away from the more menial manual tasks where they're not really adding value. Um, and it will allow the people, you know, compliance officers to be more involved in designing the AI and actually thinking more critically about how to better identify and disrupt financial crime flows. Um, I mean, there are, you know, official statistics indicate that something like 1% of global illicit flows are detected at the moment through banks' compliance processes. I mean, 1% is nothing. So if technology replaces compliance officers in identifying and catching that 1%, that leaves a lot for, you know, you know the compliance officers can go after the remaining 99%. There's still going to be plenty to do. And it's going to be much more engaging um, intellectually challenging work, thinking about how to properly identify and stop those flows. Um, so it's going to be a shift in the role of compliance officers and the nature of the role may change and compliance officers may need to become more familiar with um, technology and they'll need to be more tech savvy, more data scientists potentially. So the, the, the type of role that they're doing will change, but actually the soft skills will remain pretty much the same. It's that attention to detail and being able to to spot patterns, uh, grasping the bigger picture and understanding how financial crime is committed so that you can understand better how to stop it. Um, and collaboration, working with other institutions and with regulators, law enforcement, et cetera, uh, and working out ways to pool the information that you have and to pool your resources to tackle this better. Those soft skills are going to be the same. So yeah, I think the, the role will change somewhat, but it's not going to be replaced. Thank you everyone for your views and for your feedback. And I think we're kind of running out of time. I've seen some more questions out there, but please don't feel free to get in touch with me or in touch with us at FinTech Bay and I can connect you to Maya or you know, to any of the teams and basically get their feedback if there's anything more you need to ask. Thank you, Maya. Thank you, Mazar. Thank you, Mohammed. I think it's been great to have the, the viewpoint from the regulator, from one of our uh, top banks and from FinTech. It's really brought perspective of every side of things. And I think, I hope everyone enjoyed it and we look forward to seeing you again. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Take care. Thanks. Bye -bye. Thank you very much.